hear me okay? So good. Yeah. So did we lose the graphic of Prajna Paramita that wasn't saved from last time, I guess? Yeah, so a lot. We found a graphic of Prajna Paramita for the Sutra, the goddess Prajna Paramita. Maybe maybe that was um Eli, maybe Eli found it? Yeah, so... Bama, I added it to the text and sent it to you. Oh, but so. I'll send it again. Yeah, so... It may, well, that may just not have worked its way into the... Yeah, well, it's, well yeah, it would be good. That was a pretty picture. Then um, uh, I've been on retreat, so uh, I'm catching up, but... Um, also, to our um, regular prayers, I want to add um, uh, a prayer to Yeshi Sogya. So, let me see. I'll just read it out, So, but then um, we can add it. Mm -hmm. So um, people maybe aren't aware, um, Yeshe Sogyo was um, Padmasambhava's uh, student that um, uh, probably lived the longest. I, I think so. somehow she lived to 100, who knows, right? But um, then she was responsible for preserving um, much of Guru Ramshay's teachings um, so he had 25 main disciples, and many times uh, she's considered the um, primary disciple. So <clears throat> I thought it'd be useful and, and necessary that we have um, that that's part of our um, beginning meditation. So uh, I'll just read out a, a very short one from uh, Dijamimshe. Queen of the hosts of wisdom Dakinis of the three abodes, my only mother, Kandra Yeshid Sogyal, to you I pray, never leave me, but look on me with compassion, grant your blessings so my mind and your wisdom may merge inseparably. That's nice, yeah. Very strong guru yoga there. So we have longer ones. We'll see, maybe, maybe we can do a long one. Then, um, so maybe at least we can put that, uh, that's from the Losawa house. I know if Dirk's listening, then he knows what I'm talking about. There's a longer one, which we could do sometimes too. Then I thought it'd also be useful to, um, you know, before doing Heart Sutra, so, to do prayer to um, Machig. So, mm. so Ma Machig loved on the, um, the, the, uh, the flame or the light from Lop, <laughs> some location, right? Drawn means like uh, sometimes Kindle, but I like that translation flame, right? So um, she uh, is credited with um, the uh, promoting and discovering to you uh, the, what's called the chair practice um, that uh, involves uh, some drums and bells and <laughs> whistles, but is the practice of um, going to the places that scare you and inviting um, uh, the demons in. So it's somewhat like a tantric tonglen. <clears throat> um, and her um, main, uh, the, it, it's centered around the, the teaching style is uh, centered around the Prajnaparamita, like that. 
So I've done a lot of chip practice. Um, so at one point in my life, I'm going to um, get as many uh, from all the different lineages, as many chip uh, initiations as possible. Don't recommend doing that because then you get too much to do. But um, I'd like to correct something like sometimes uh, um, it's thought that uh, chip practice is only uh, enigma practice. Um, Actually, Chia practice is a strong, very in Kaku school also, and um, very strong in uh, Gelukat Dao Lama's practice. Um, so <clears throat> maybe that's something we could do. We'd have to start on retreat, but um, and I know you met him, at, and I didn't either, but uh, Zhang Lim She, I was talking with some students. Um, you can look him up, Z O N G has interesting, is, He's had a reincarnation now, but he's like a uh, long beard, and he was known as uh, a strong chip practitioner. So that's the, what's called the Ganden chip practice. Um, <clears throat> so this is the prayer to Machik Ladrung by uh, Patro Rinpoche. Some people would know who Patro Rinpoche is. So I'm giving a little bit of provenance. Uh, Patra Rinpoche was um, uh, 19th century and known particularly for uh, Dzogchen practice, of course, but um, promoting the Bodhisattva Charivatara, the Bodhisattva way of life, um, and making that a core teaching. <clears throat> So, prayer to Machik. Ascertaining the natural state of threefold knowledge and practicing the key points of the four applications, one arrives perfectly at the ultimate fruition, Dharmakala, Dharmakaya. Mother of the Buddhas of the three times do I pray, profound basic space, Dharmakaya mother beyond attachment, manifest perfectly as the wisdom mudra of clear realization whose display arises to disciples' perception in wrathful guise. Exalted Kodakali, look upon me with compassion, playful dance of emanation bringing benefit to beings who fulfills the aspirations of the great Panditas of India and appear to Tibetans in female human form. Mother Lapki Dongma, inspire me with your blessings. Spoken by the one named Patro. Isn't that nice? <clears throat> so, uh, if people know a little bit, Manchik's story, of course, had a difficult life just like Yeshe Sogel and um, um, had uh, realizations and promoted this practice. And, um, well, people were skeptical, right? Because, like, Who's this? She's a nobody and she's a she, so what's going on here? Um, so I think I have the story so many learned. <laughs> Ram is like kind of tested and they go, oh yeah, this is, um, yeah, she's got it, you know, pretty good. But um, we still have some doubts. So um, uh, we, we're not, we're not sure whether this would fly in India because at that point in the history of Tibet, they were very interested. There were some homemade fuzzy teachings and they wanted to see, well, is this a teaching that we could trace back to India, to the Buddha, you know, something like that. So actually, um, no, I'm not sure. I think she may have gone to India actually. Um, or some panditas came up, and they also said, yeah, this, this is the real thing. So it's a very interesting story. Probably that's very realistic, you know? So um, uh, maybe we can add those uh, two prayers. Now we have electronics, so we don't have to print up in a book necessarily, but it might be nice. Mm -hmm. So well, this is uh, part of the talk tonight, today about um, 
working with the teacher because, of course, a, a large part of the meditational, narrative meditations we do, sometimes called prayers, involve um, paying homage to our teachers, right? <clears throat> There's a famous um, poem by the Buddha, um, or saying, maybe talk, that Buddhas do not um, cure by laying on of hands. The Buddhas do not um, wipe away sins with water. The Buddhas do not transfer realizations who can complete the poem? Yes. The Buddhas can only teach. Yeah. So uh, it, uh, it's a great poem. It's a little polemical, right? <laughs> so against the, uh, uh, the traditions of the day, because of course we, we would learn it if we could just be healed by laying on hands. We would love it if uh, karma could just be washed away. We would really love it if realizations could just be transferred. Nice, you know, we paid for that. In fact, people do pay for that. It's like, um, yeah, so um, maybe 15, maybe even 20 years ago now, like, um, Master, Tony's master actually came through and gave a um, um, program at uh, Unity Church there on Folsom. Um, I wouldn't have gone because I'm always interested if I'd been sponsored, but um, it cost $200. I was really broke then, but um, basically the promise was when this teacher touches you on your head, all your karma will be purified. Two bucks. Deal. You know, so <laughs> all my students around, I said, you go. And I said, guy, how many people are there? How many people? Yeah, like over 200. Yeah. So maybe, okay, you know, I don't know, but that's not part of our system, you know. So I wish it was that easy. Sometimes the text, you know, sometimes we go, we do this practice and then we'll clean up your karma, but they don't mention it takes a lot of, it, they should be mentioning it takes a lot of work. But I, I don't think it's that easy. Just, you know, pop on the head, do you? It's blessings. Blessings are nice. Like, may, may you, you know, be happy and free. The blessings are important, but um, it's all about teaching. Because it's all about teaching, that's why, you know, we really make an effort to, in the tradition, to produce good teachers. And when they're found, we, we really make an effort to get with them and support them. And in, you know, traditional Indian style and Tibetan style, we're, we're, we're enthusiastic about them, particularly in Vajrayana, particularly in um, Tantric Buddhism. <clears throat> And teaching can happen on all different levels, just information and um, all the way up to, you know, direct, um, unmediated, non-conceptual uh, teaching. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to cover the whole gamut in 20 minutes. How's that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, even going from just being like a preceptor to um, um, you know being a monsita or or doing profound guru yoga, it's still like a teaching. Okay, it still applies that the teacher cannot just heal you by laying out of hands. Can trans you know. Of course, blessings and there is energy, but it can't be magical or saving. You can't just wipe away karma. And even when the teacher is realized or a Buddha, you cannot, you know, just kind of do Shakti Patras and saying, can't do it. 
just teaching. So automatically when we're doing um, Guru Yoga or Shankimuni's prayers and Machik or Yashit Sogyal or Prajnaparamita, um, when we say um, these wonderful teachers, we're basically praising and enthusiastic and devoted to the teacher-student relationship like that. We don't usually, it's like, we don't usually say that in the text. It looks like we're just saying, like, Siddhartha, you're great, or Yashisogu, you're great. But it's understood in the tradition that the teacher and the um, teachings, is that a word? Students are interdependent. Otherwise, it's kind of rock star, right? Um, um, in a book I still recommend, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by Chung Purim Shea, um, he mentions how if you're just saying the teacher is fantastic, but you're a wretched worm, you're, you're not doing it. You know, that's really pathetic. So um, there uh, has to be an understanding of relationship, a true relationship, and uh, a growth in the understanding of interdependence. So uh, basically, if you read the current issue of the Roar, I think I might have said the Guru Yoga is really understanding um, interdependence. And in this case, um, you know, using or having the relationship with um, a teacher as one of the primary ways we realize interdependence, right? There are other ways too, right? You know, there's. Um, doing the dishes properly and, um, you know, um, helping our pets and our kids and everything. But um, the role of the teacher is, um, in a Vajrayana way, uh, like Trung she said, <laughs> the role of the teacher is to insult you. Vajrayana <laughs> always uses these um, Oh, very dramatic um, presentations. Uh, but the idea is to point out what what the limitations of uh, misperceived self are and to point out um, your Buddha nature and your goodness at the same time. <laughs> Usually, um, as people progress on the path, um, they alternate somewhat. In America, it has to be you're doing a great job all the time, or people will leave. But in, in Asia, they usually alternate by, um, oh, great, thank you for being here. And then later, it will be, um, you're doing it wrong. And then it'll be, great, thank you for being here, you're doing good. And then you're doing it wrong. And <laughs> because um, uh, reality uh, alternates like that. So to understand how the nature of um, the misperceived self and the Buddha nature work together, you, you have to uh, generally teach in an alternating way. Um, I liken it to uh, getting, getting a heavy, old heavy refrigerator out of its niche in the kitchen. The old ones have no wheels. And you have to do this, right? You can't just pull it right out. You have to do this, right? <clears throat> so, um, in Buddhist teaching, we teach interdependence by um, not just saying everything is connected radically, which is true, but to teach it, you have to alternate um, uh, the uh, presentation, you have to say, well, now uh, take step forward with the left, and then you have to step forward with the right. Then now you're doing it, uh, that's it, and that's not it. 
it's through this dialectic that um, we reach what's called the middle way um, between extremes and the middle way of balance. And in our tradition, that's um, uh, enlightenment is the middle way. <clears throat> but um, you can't, uh, in the lower traditions, <laughs> it makes it sound like we can just aim for the middle right there, you know, just right there. But um, you actually can't do it that way. You have to like, um, it's like sailing into the wind. You have to tack a little bit this way and then that way. So in our tradition, we have to say, well, this is this is a delusional state. This is um, the seeing the truth. This is false. This is true, and. Um, we have to hold them up so you see them both at the same time. I've talked a lot about this, haven't I? But since people forget, I'll go over it. You people. A lot of times it's very nice, you know, to just like just tell me the truth, how it is. But um then that can be just kind of turning left all the time. <laughs> we also have to show like where where we're going wrong. Like, please don't jump off that cliff. Please don't take that methamphetamine, you know, like have a, you know, some apple juice, right? So um, because you can't just teach by telling people this is how it is completely. And you just can't teach completely by telling everybody how they're doing it wrong. You have to vary it. Um, and everybody has uh, a slightly different um, wavelength or um, oscillation, maybe, would that be the right word? And it's like some people you can really, uh, you can go way out, you know. So you can go like, okay, you're going great, going great. And then you can like, another sailing metaphor, we have a sail, another sails a sailor too, you know, it's like, then all of a sudden you can just jibe, you know, <laughs> and it's very abrupt like that. But that's difficult, right? Because you might get hit by that, <laughs> the boom, right? <laughs> but generally, uh, we have to kind of uh, do this, and then gradually, as we progress in the path, then you can widen the spectrum. But at first, you have to like. <clears throat> I wasn't, um, I only had really one good math teacher and I, who I actually like because like, um, he would, I don't know, math teachers were always male in the old days. That, that's not true anymore, right? Yeah, good. But um, he, he would show how to do the equations wrong. You know, like here, here's, you know, and then you, and then you go like equation here, put equation there on the blackboard, and then you'd have to kind of go. They almost look alike except for one little dash or some ridiculous thing, and then you'd have to say which one is which. I, I like that kind of style, like that. Just then you get to see. <clears throat> so in our tradition, we are very emphasized on uh, alternating. Uh, so we have a wide spectrum, which means you have a large um, capacity to teach and to learn the more you widen the field. Um, but ultimately, you want to get to the point where you see um, there, uh, them simultaneously, right? The Buddha sees it simultaneously. So that's why I sometimes say, well, the, the path is like alternating uh, at first, but then it turns into like um, a railroad. So your your energy is running on these railroad ties, so they're tracking like that. <clears throat> that's why um, I put so much emphasis on the meditation practice called uh, shamatha because. Um, 
the emphasis is on on balance there and balancing um, your states of mind um, so that you can see both to use psych terms, but you can see both your anxiety and your depression at the same time by being in the middle. <clears throat> so the teaching methodology and the teacher are meant to be merged. Is that getting clear? So it isn't like, well, the teacher is really nifty. Uh, it's funny <laughs> or something and it's powerful, you know, those kinds of things. No, it, it, the, the teaching and the teacher, uh, as we progress, you know, are kind of merged. So um, the Buddha could say, if you see me, you see the Dharma. If you see the Dharma, you see me. I mean, that's not like me personally. That's meaning I'm just like 100% I'm 100% teaching. I'm not, you know, I'm not just, you know. So that's difficult. That's a high level, very high level practice when teacher is saying, I'm just, I'm on all the time. And that's how my teacher taught me. So I have to be on all the time. It actually feels easier that way. So it's weird, but. You know, so you, there's no kind of like, well, maybe I'm not teaching. I'm just being, you know, I'm just eating popcorn and watching, you know, Princess Bride or something. <laughs> or there has to be something like, because not recently, but a while back, I did watch Princess Bride eating popcorn. So I have to be thinking, like, if, if a student was here, would, would this could be a teaching like, okay, well, like the Lama watches Princess Bride and eats popcorn, you know. Uh, so this teaching style, the truth, which is what we're after, and kind of the personality structure are integrated. That's uh, high level teaching. That's what I'm trying to do here. Um, and wonderful teachers um, that I've met in my life do. Um, but that doesn't mean we can always do that, you know? So um, you can get a teaching from a book or the internet, you know, it's getting information, but um, it, it's it's harder to have the dialectic when, when you were just getting kind of information or it's harder to get the dialectic unless you have a relationship um, of dialogue. In our tradition, um, we can actually talk to Buddhas. I think that's great, don't you? You know, it's like some traditions they go, even Buddhist traditions, no, well, the Buddha died, and um, it's just us, and you you know, you can't talk to Tara or Chenrezig or Manjushri or anything, and you'd just be psychotic. Um, but if you're talking to a Buddha or Bodhisattva or and they're saying intelligent things, um, then it's working, right? Well, that's our approach. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but it has to be like a, a two-way dialogue, like with your living teacher, and even if you have a celestial Buddha teacher or Tara Rajasattva or something. Um, and if you're having a dialogue with um, I'm just calling Celestial or Sambhogakaya Buddha. Um, if if the um, discussion is one way, that's not good because it's just one way, it's one-sided. Uh, and if the Buddha figure always agrees with you, what does that mean? No. <laughs> so, like, uh, when Kansa she was here oh, a while back, you know, I said, if, if Manjushri appears before you and agrees with everything you said, then guess what? That's now Manjushri, so <laughs> the wisdom Buddha, you know. So there's a dialogue, right? So there's there are teaching, um, you know, I said alternating, you know, why you know, correct, delusional, correct, delusional, but it it's also has to be a dialogue. 
That's why all the sutras and even the tantras are dialogues, just like Socratic dialogues. But it was there, or somebody was there, and they asked a question, and then they did this and did that. So there's an interchange. Because the wisdom happens as a result of the interchange. The middle age and easy, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so as we become more committed to the path, uh, we might start with just someone who's uh, giving information, and eventually that person might be a spiritual friend, Kalyana Mitra. Eventually, we might see that person as a uh, teacher, the lowercase t, and then maybe uppercase t later. And then um, uh, if you really relate to the teacher as the Vajracharya, then the Vajra master, you know, um, <clears throat> which takes time to develop. Um, I started out just reading stuff and exploring, and it took me years to get to the point with my teacher to say, okay, I'll do it your way. Well, I want to share that with you. It took a long time because you're thinking, well, I don't know who I am, and you know, what if they take advantage of me, you know, or they... Um, so you have to check it out, but eventually I just went, I basically said, like, I'll just do whatever you tell me to do, not in, um, not in a subservient way, but just like, hey, we're on the side of the mountain. I, I'm not, you know, you, you know, you've been up and down the mountain a bunch of times. I'm not going to argue with you. And uh, it worked. So, but it takes time to get to that point where um, we're willing to take uh, certain leaps. So, <clears throat> you know, we need, that's part of the path is to check it out. But the methodology is uh, to alternate so that people um, uh, eventually can see um, both sides of the coin, both uh, mistakes and correctness at the same time, and then see the middle between the two. And hopefully the teacher is acting that way. So um, um, with, with students that have been around for a while here, I can alternate, you know, and it's really fun and they kind of get it. But if that's not their style, then it's an, if they don't want to do that, um, then it's really annoying. <laughs> I'm, you know, um, there might be some people that like to be told they're wrong all the time, you know, but usually people want to be told they're right all the time. So I do joke sometimes, I'm everyone's llama until I say no. <laughs> Uh, in our tradition, to make it, uh, when you say, you know, from real high Vajrayana Guru Yoga, you're merging your mind with the Lama's mind, um, we do want to have the same realization as our Ramshe, as our teacher. Um, but we have to be clear what's, what's the content of that realization. So depending upon different... Um, systems of practice, we, we might reply in different ways, right? You know, we might say, uh, I had the realization that um, my experience, the knowing uh, experiential mind is completely clear, empty, and unimpeded. You know, we might go like that. Um, and I'll go, that, that's good. I'll, I'll have to test you on that because you might be able to read that in a book. Or you might say, the nature of my being is totally uh, free and spontaneously expresses itself. And um, uh, you might have read that in a book, so I'll have to test you on that. Um, or you might even say, I'm okay just as I am. And I say, you might have read that in a book. And um, I will definitely insult you if you say that and see what happens. Uh, <laughs> are you really okay? If you're totally okay as you am, you're totally okay if someone calls you a jerk, right? Does, does that make sense? Or is that just Buddhist logic sense? Okay. So, but um, I I will eventually come back to, uh, I will want to hear about uh, relationship and interdependence. Right? Come back to that, because that's uh, very difficult to realize. 
because we can be thinking, oh, I'm, I'm experiencing in my room by myself. Uh, I'm perfectly calm and I feel spacious and knowing and feels great. Um, but then we're not interacting with anybody, right? So um, um, after, after Mahamudra comes relationships. Like that. Yeah, right? So um, my teacher never did only test me on doctrine and uh, meditative states, but uh, as I mentioned a number of times, would say, hey, nothing's going on with the family. You're gonna get right. How are you how are you manifesting interdependence? All the time. Are you doing it all the time? Or just when you're kind of reading books and under ideal conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So like that. Oh, I was sorry, you went more than 20 minutes, but maybe we can have a few comments. I like to thank the IT crowd in the, the booth there. Thank you for your help. Or I forget. Without that interdependence, I wouldn't be able to do it. I don't know how to do what you do. So I'm totally inter. Yeah, sure. sure. That's all I can. Whatever you're doing. Yeah. But I, I really like to have a microphone if people want to make a comment. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your message today I appreciate it and I wanted to ask you you were talking about a few times um, how these teachers sometimes insult you um, sometimes you know if you're, if you're called a, a jerk like it shouldn't get to you and I'm sort of of the mind that I try to gravitate toward people that kind of resonate a kind of compassion, yeah. um, and sort of like a, like sort of support harmony. Uh, and I understand that that's maybe like novice practice potentially, mm -hmm. and that you should be able to invite demons at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, you know, um, when I guess we all kind of experience some measure of mistreatment or abuse in the world too and it makes sense to sort of evade that situation or remove yourself from those persons and so there's there's an interesting tension that's happening between those two um, modes of logic and I'd love to hear you comment on that how you kind of maybe balance that tension of not subjecting yourself to abuse but also being able to engage in those spaces. So the abuse thing is a whole different issue. So basically, you know, I'm just being dramatic. Like it's it's very difficult, you know, like someone's had a, put in a lot of practice, for example, gone on retreat. Um, they've had certain meditative experiences, right? Um, that they, you know, I'm just giving an example, kind of generic example, that um, they may feel like they've understood uh, something about emptiness or interdependence, and then then I have to say, well, you you've had an interesting meditative experience, but that's not what um, we mean by realization. So I'm not calling them a jerk, you know, but it's feeling like I'm calling them a jerk because I put in a lot of work, and I'm really certain. And now you're telling me that, um, you know, I I didn't have the realization that I thought I had. It's like that. So a lot of times for people that, that feels, you know, it's a huge narcissistic injury to use psych terms because um, they have a lot invested in the validity of their experience. And a lot of meditative experiences are valid, but at, at the level that they're valid at, right? <laughs> so you say, well, I had experiences of floating, you know, and um, maybe you did even float it six inches off the ground. And I go, well, that that could happen. And, you know, um, that's neat. But uh, 
um, and that demonstrates something, but that's not what we mean by um, the nature of mind or um, compassion or realization. That's just you have developed a certain power that you can float. But for some people, they might think, well, that is evidence of my realization of the nature of awareness or interdependence. And then when I say no, then um, I can feel like I'm saying they're an idiot. But I'm just saying no, that's not it. I guess it also, maybe not, not coming from the teacher directly, but yeah. just from the world, you know, when you experience yeah. unpleasant personalities or people yeah. that kind of, you know, yeah. just offend your sensibility or yeah. whatever. How do you hold space with those people and kind of like stay close to them without mm -hmm. maybe becoming a glutton for punishment, you know? Well, you should have been here like a month ago in case you tend to so doing the eight verses, yeah, that's a really important question, which um, I want to get into in another talk, like, you know, because um, Lojong training does talk about how to, how to work with, um, you know, really difficult situations or abusive situations or even violent situations, you know, and, uh, and it's talked about in, in kind of uh, um, very unique ways like that. So that that's um, that's a little different than what I'm talking about. I guess you know, being a little dramatic, so contextualizing. But um, when when we're really studying with the teacher, particularly if we see that teacher as a Buddha or even just a Kalyana Mitra or even just kind of a teacher with a T, that um, uh, it's important to have uh, at least the the working approach that this person. Um, is confident for starters, um, but uh, really does care about us and has our best interests in mind. Because then the context is is still going to be one of healing, even if um, you know some feedback might sting a little bit. Um, and that that's this very subtle process, you know. Absolutely. I haven't experienced this here, by the way. I, I had a friend from the past though who kind of. Mm -hmm. assumed the role of teacher in my yeah, life right and was kind of i i recognized him as kind of like a toxic personality right right and he said i'm trying to dissolve your ego that's why i insult you so much yeah that's yeah. And, <laughs> and i i kind of felt like so I, when i when you when you said that i kind yeah. of thought about that situation yeah. so anyway and it was a different tradition entirely right um but uh, anyway thank yeah. you. we never want anybody to um you know the situation like here is, um, is a little bit like a training dojo in martial arts. You always want a mat. Yeah, I'm not interested in slamming people on the concrete. Yeah. I recognize Thank that. You. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Oh. I appreciate your metaphor of uh, sailing against the wind to explain the middle way. Uh, and I find that those are characteristics of also good leadership, right? To be able to always show that you support and you do, and you have a person's best interest in mind, but you also have to identify areas for growth Yeah. Uh, and parenting, same thing. Uh, but we live in a land where everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> so uh, I find that there's quite a few people that are well. I mean, and we're not we're talking here in a um, a spiritual realm, but in the world, uh, people are resistant, at least in this country, like you mentioned, of that type of teaching, because uh, I think a lot of people feel that everything should always be positive, that we can only grow through positive, and never identifying. Uh, areas that require more attention. So that I that is the kind of a um, uh, what do you call that a uh, cognitive dissonance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That I experience with what you're talking about. It takes a lot of skill to explain exactly how um, we do go wrong. So there's a lot of. Um, in the tradition about like um, 
you know, exploring how we get locked in samsara. Um, so, you know, kind of like there's the Buddhist, like DSM-5, you know, um, like let's track all the um, uh, unproductive states or something like that. Um, but uh, they're still done in the spirit of, um, well, that's interesting. Let's see, you know, where where we went off track ultimately. It's it's that like, well, that's still interesting. We went off track there. And um a lot of times can be said exploring how we go off track. And that does take a lot of faith and devotion lots of times in Bodhicitta, because you just want to kind of like, okay, I, I got that wrong. Now, now tell me how to do it. And many times teachers have to resist the you know the seductive pull to like immediately you know um you know show show all the cards right at least my teachers did so yeah i mean a lot, a lot of my teachers were like and i should mention good psychotherapy teachers too like the basic mantra would be, well, that's incorrect, but that's really interesting that you came up with that incorrect answer. Oh, let's look at that. You know, something like that. <laughs> you go, oh, okay. That, yeah, good points. Mike, you will get the microphone next. How do um, students demonstrate growth in their understanding of uh, interdependence and what is a, a teacher looking for as signs of their ability to manifest sort of this inter interdependence? That's a long reply. <laughs> um, so much of uh, when we're thinking of Buddhism, we think of meditation. So meditation very broadly is we're willing to sit still and um, be present to the argument in our head, right? <laughs> you know, we're kind of going, okay, I'm going to listen to, you know, and that's really important, right? You know, I'm just going to sit still and just going to listen, you know, to the chatter. So um, in our tradition, we don't immediately shut off that chatter. We're, we're interested in well, what are the different sides saying, right? So I'm looking for that because um, interdependence generally would not be like, I just wanted to shut my mind off, you know, and get clarity because that's not the way you get clarity. The way you get clarity is, you, you know, you're, hmm, you know, that's coming that way. Um, a big way, which is important and why we have a building in a temple practice is um, to see if we can work with others, right? So some people really like people and they are kind of cave yogis, but um, when they do come out, they're really willing to work with others too. Um, so, you know, I'm looking at that. So um, it's an open secret that sometimes when we have things to do here. I'll try to put people together that maybe you know, wouldn't naturally want to work together. <laughs> um, it, things happen maybe slower, right? but um, we're not really, in, you know, the, the product is us. The product isn't, you know, something other than our, our own um, liberation, right? That, that's usually the hardest, like, you, you want me to work with who, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so actually, people here are pretty good at that. And then we have, um, have started a Delic chaplaincy program, meaning working, working with um, difficult people out in the community, you know, because we're all kind of, everyone here is pretty nice. Um, but um, you know, that's not a, a full practice. We also have to in, engage with the world. So some people go, well, I just love coming here, but I don't want to work with, you know, these difficult people. And then 
that would be an, a missed opportunity, you know, like that. <laughs> There's lots more, but um, uh, a big part of the tradition is, are we willing to debate and are we willing to debate with ourselves? So there's more, that's a lot, you know, have to be a short answer for now. Thank you, good question. Yes, one more, two more, and then we're done. Um, thanks. The two um, tacking back and forth between the left and the right, yeah. Um, are the two um, polarities distinct? Are they very distinct? Or is it something that more just sort of um, evolves any manifests in relation? Or is it kind of like, oh, it's time to turn? Or maybe it is time to turn, but it's, I don't know. That was my question. Are they, are they distinct? That's a really good question. Um... There's some uh, there's a real distinction between delusion and the truth, um, but those aren't really polarities, actually. Um, so uh, then there's there's a, there's a, is a polarity between you know kind of. Uh, right and left and kind of doing it correctly and incorrectly. So when we say incorrectly, um, it's kind of wrong, but it's not totally delusional, right? Because most of our activities are not totally delusional. They're just not going to achieve our ends, right? So um, it's like when... <laughs> it's like, Okay, so for one, one summer I was kind of a cook's helper at college and was trying to cut the tomato with the wrong kind of knife. It was too dull. I just thought I'd apply more pressure. <laughs> so I so said, no, if you get the right knife, it just kind of like, so it wasn't totally wrong, right? And like I had, I knew what a tomato was. I got the knife and I was slicing it but it, it was kind of like not optimal. So that would be a polarity. But um, we actually don't have a polarity with delusion. So um, we, delusion itself uh, it evaporates. But we, we have to, um, I, I would say in a way delusion arises because um, we're never taught like here's, here's the really sharp knife way to cut your beautiful tomato, and here's the dull way. See, because um, if we we haven't developed the um, prajna, we haven't developed the discriminating awareness to see, you know, um, so we go way off the other side. But when we develop discriminating awareness that sees like, well, you know, th this is this is in tune, and that's not in tune. See, I, I, I'm not that good. I can't tell, well, that's in tune and that's not in tune. So my guitar teacher just gave up on me. No, she didn't actually. I gave up, but just teasing. But it's, it was really hard. It's really hard for me to, to distinguish. So it'd go way off. But when you learn to distinguish things, you can tell the difference like between different shades of green. You know, you go to the store, um, and you know, then then something changes. So the the way to the Dharma pedagogy is actually not to try to contrast always delusion with um, you know total truth, but to kind of take the polarity of truth and kind of half truth. Like it's kind of wrong, but not totally wrong. Um, maybe those in the audience of discovered in the last few years, if you try to argue with someone or confront someone's delusion directly, how, how much traction are you going to get? Zero, yeah. So what we want to do is we want to establish, you know, kind of like gradations where like, oh, well, that, you could use that knife, but that's going to take a lot of pressure. And then you have a squished tomato and we want a nice big tomato slice. So with this knife, you can do this. So we're, we're 
we're developing a subtle awareness mind that, um, and also I should add with Tantra, it's kind of blissful, like um, you have this wonderful tomato, obviously I'm getting hungry, and then, you know, and it's nice, it, it just feels so great to have a working whatever. Then that blissful experience with the correct knife then confronts the delusion. Okay. So we're so it's not the yin yang thing like we need bad people to have good people. No, you don't need bad people to have good people. So uh we're we're developing insight, awareness, wisdom through uh developing a very subtle mind and a, and an energetic or blissful mind even. And then with that, you're confronting a basic delusion. This is important, yeah. So be, you can't just always go directly after a delusion because delusions are designed to be impermeable, right? Except um, they're not expecting us to come with, with what we call wisdom mind. They're expecting the delusions are like, there are a wall that's expecting us to come with a battering ram. But uh, in our tradition, I, th I say, you know, we, we plant flowers by the wall or plant a tree. So we all know that if you plant a tree next to a wall, eventually the wall's history, right? So it's like that. So by developing very discriminating awareness, by contrasting things that are very close, then combining that with the energies uh, so that's why we do a lot of the internal yogas, um, very powerful awareness, very powerful emotional state. Then when you go into the cave to confront the beast, you won't be overwhelmed. But so many people, they just want to, they're hot dog cowboy Buddhas, and they want to kind of like, you know, I'm just going to go in and deal with it, you know, and um, they get, you know, they get psychotic. So we look like a little slower startup sometimes as Buddhists or something, you know, but then we're 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 going in thoroughly prepared like that. So you're you're actually going in with um your wisdom sword to cut your tomato demon, you know, something like that. So that's a good question. This is important because some traditions think, well, you have to like sin so that grace may abound, you know. Um, or you need evil people to have good people. Uh, that's just crazy, right? So, you know, as therapist, you know, sometimes use the example of people say, well, it's all relative. And I go, well, it depends what you mean by relative, but there there can never be any benefit from child abuse, right? Nothing, never, ever any benefit. No one can say, oh, well, this made this person stronger or better. No, it's impossible. So that's total delusion, right? But of course, when raising, <laughs> you know, is you know, we're, there's, there's a lot of little variations, and if you don't have a very, you know, subtle style, then, um, you know, you're trying to cut your tomato with a butter knife, right? And the kids will win, right? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Hope it was a good answer. Yeah. So maybe we, we you've been very patient. So yeah. I, I feel like um the uh, the actor at the end of Midsummer's Night's Dream, you know, so sorry if you know I've wasted your time and we're we're very dreamlike. So um you know, please forgive me and enjoy your life, right? So let's let's do closing prayers. Okay, Puck. Dedication. Do the merits of these virtuous actions. May I quickly attain the state of the Buddha, and all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel, Bodhicitta, that is not arisen, rise and grow. May that which has risen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful, shall resonate, and jatsa, please remain until samsara ends. 
May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the approach to teachings remain forever. May all nightmares achieve happiness. May they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losa, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of all the Buddha's compassion, Jishri, master of all his wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, I think we have a lot of food today, so please stick around for community time. Food. Food. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A couple things, Susan, we're getting there. Um, I have a sign-up sheet to help uh, Sasha and her boyfriend, Joe. Sasha's um, having some uh, health issues. Um, so just trying to help them walk the dog a little bit. It's a small terrier. It does well with other small dogs in case you want to double up your walks. Um, midday, so if you want to fill in your names on this, that would be great. I'll be sending it out as a Google Doc soon. Um, did you, just this. Okay, do you actually want the microphone? Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, this is the community service announcement. Um, let's see, there's a number, there's three things. First of all, we've got a, a food drive. Um, there's a box in the back and I understand the stuff is called the, it's for the River City Food Bank. Mm -hmm. And on the roar, there's a list of things that they really want, canned foods, peanut butter, baby stuff, um, so there's that. And um, I'm hoping to be able to do something we did pre-COVID, um, which is to deliver a little package of homemade cookies to our neighbors. Um, I walked up and down and there's about 60, amazingly, there's about 60 different mm. abodes on B Street and then around the corner a little bit. And so uh, what we did several years ago, eight, 2018, maybe 19, we just put together little packages of about a half a dozen cookies and you know put a little label on it and said, hope you enjoy these homemade cookies. Merry or no, happy holidays, Lions or Dharma Center. Anyway, so I'm just putting that out there. I haven't really figured out a date yet, but probably somewhere around the 16th, 17th, 18th of December. Um, if you want to consider making some cookies, a couple dozen, three dozen, five dozen, I'm gonna, we're going to need a lot of cookies. Um, so I'm just putting that out there and we'll put something in the roar eventually, but put your, your chef's hat on for cookie baking, if you would. Um, Oh, and then one other thing is I little birds have been saying that um, we can use a little more help around the Dharma Center, just kind of keeping your eyes open and noticing that, oh, maybe the floor needs vacuuming, or maybe the dishes need to be done, or there's some tables that need to be set up, that kind of stuff. So just, um, just kind of being alert to what is needed here and there as you're kind of standing around and chatting with folks. Okay, those are the community service announcements for the day. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for um, your attention. Um, may you all be free and happy and may the world be free and happy and at peace. We're not gonna give up, are we? No, all right. See you for a meal, perhaps. Hope so. Ciao. Okay, we need some music. So. I'm kind of. <laughs>